Welcome to Recruiting.Work, a place to connect, communicate, and collaborate on all things recruitment. This session is brought to you by Outmatch. Just as Recruiting.Work brings people in the talent community together, Outmatch brings recruitment technologies together, combining assessments, video interviewing, and reference checking software. They're creating a more holistic, more human hiring experience. Learn more at Outmatch.com. All right, let's jump right into it. Thank you, everybody, for attending another episode in Recruiting at Work, where TA professionals from across the country get together and have conversations on various topics that we all come across on a typically a daily basis. Our topic for today is part of our ongoing series called Recruiting by the Numbers, where once a month we'll kind of come back and circle around on this topic about essentially knowing your data in recruiting or TA as a whole. Our topic of the day for today is, are we ready to benchmark in 2021? We hear a lot about knowing your data and Tableau and Power BI are some database tools and things like that. But in my experience, it's really interesting to get that first part of really understanding what's going on in your program and then working your way towards actually getting numbers in to be able to report on them. But first, really getting into and knowing your program. With us today, we have uh, Tara Noonan Amaral out of New York, Susan Ross out of Atlanta. We have Millie uh, who will be joining us hopefully later. She's not quite on yet, but she is out of Miami. I'm not gonna say her last name because I don't wanna say it wrong. And then we have Christy Harper out of New York City. So again, uh, are we ready to benchmark in 2021? Before we jump into it, one quick housekeeping item. And that is if I can get everybody, it's in regards to the chat area. So I encourage any and all audience members in that chat area to ask any questions, add any comments, anything like anything like that. Before you do, if you go into that chat area at the bottom, that drop-down menu is going to say to all panelists. The drop-down menu, I want everybody to change that to say all panelists and attendees. I want to make sure that the conversations throughout the community and that uh, us panelists are not hogging the conversation. So please go down to that chat area, change that to all panelists to say, to all panelists and attendees. Now, with that said, uh, Tara, do you mind if we jump to you and have you start off the conversation? Sure, and uh, hello everyone. Sorry, I had some unexpected oral surgery this morning. So if I'm slurring a little bit, it's not because I've had a margarita. I'm actually calling you from South Carolina. Uh, We've got a chilly, cloudy day here. Um, And just as an update, I am actually working in an advisory capacity for some VC firms and some um, larger organizations as they are rethinking um, post-pandemic, how are people coming back to recruiting? And one of the biggest topics we're finding is, because everyone is really talking about benchmarking, how do I redesign my TA organization? And one of the things that's come up, whether you're an in-house team, an agency team, or an RPO team, is a lot of firms let go or de-layer their TA organizations during the thick of the pandemic. And now they're trying to figure out, how do I build it back? With the uncertainty of knowing what's going on, do I functionalize? Do I align towards critical jobs? But one of the things that's really coming up is they really want to make sure that they're designing and managing the the recruiting process with a lot more diligence. And some of my colleagues on the phone will talk about that. So one of the things that's popped up in a lot of my discovery sessions is the, the need for that first line of recruiting manager to really understand what are the objectives of the organization? Is it about class hiring? Is it about hard to find jobs? Is it about the cycle time of the recruiters and of the hiring managers? And what I'm finding in both discovery conversations, as well as my past experiences, whatever you call it, team leader, recruiting manager, or strategist, the person who is supervising a team of sourcers or recruiters is really the linchpin to success. And how they are understanding the business needs, the priorities, and the metrics within your CRM, your ATS, or your Excel spreadsheet really becomes the special sauce to whether or not it's all working. Um, And so making sure that that first line leader understands the priorities, is really comfortable with data and coaching, and more importantly, knows how to use the tools that we're asking recruiters to use. So if you're recommending a sourcing tool, 
that leader really needs to know the ins and outs of what makes that tool effective. Are you partnering with your providers, or whatever they call them, success uh, coaches, to make sure that your team is optimizing any of the tools that you have and that that leader knows how to get the best performance out of the tool and can be a player coach for the people that are doing the day-to-day activities. So I'd love to hear how some of the benchmarking, but this, I would say, you know, in the last month, I've probably talked to 10 or 11 organizations and they're really struggling with things like span of control. Um, how many people does a team leader manage? It depends on how they're organized. Is it, is it all the t- same kind of recruiting or is it spread like peanut butter and everybody's doing a little bit of everything? But however you're designing your system, that leader is really vital for the people doing the day-to-day job, as well as for communicating with your client base, whether it's HR or the frontline business leaders. So Sean, I'll toss it back to you. Yeah. So Tara, I had, I had a name for those people when back in the day when I was doing a lot of consulting. So about 15 years, I'd go in and help develop internal sourcing and strategic recruiting programs. And I always called, you took your, your line of recruiters, right? They're working the desk, they're filling recs, they're doing their thing. And whoever they immediately reported to, that was what I called the success factor. And that, and that person, uh, kind of reiterating what you said, was really the clear determining factor. As I could come in there, I could say, is this going to be really successful here, what I'm trying to do? Or is it going to be hard, hard to get to be at that success level? And it did get determined by that success factor person. And ultimately, if that person was spending the majority of their time dealing with issues upward in the business, their VP or the business units, or was it facing downward, for lack of better words, with the recruiting team to be that resource? And if they were looking more within their team, I, I, wanted, I don't want to say that we're down, but that's kind of in an org chart, that's the direction. Uh, the more they were in there, the, the greater that success would be. So Yeah, I totally agree with you. Let I me throw- think you, make a, you both make a really good point in that it that person needs to be the storyteller. They need to be the storyteller of recruiting and what they're doing back to the organization. And they also need to be the person that's telling the story of the organization to those frontline recruiters so they can appear knowledgeable and that they know, they know the whys behind what the company is doing and what the company is asking them to do so they can tell that to candidates. Great point, Christy. Let me, let me throw a question back at you, Tar. Um, when a new rec comes in, or I know Susan's going to get into kind of workforce planning, but being that knowledgeable leader, I don't know if it would fall under benchmarking, but maybe like I called it scorecarding when it was, was weekly reporting and kind of tell the state of the state on a weekly basis. And it really gave that team leader the vision into what's going on in the program by recruiter, by record, what have you. Um, yeah, again, I don't know if that classifies benchmarking, but it did let data tell the story. Any, any thoughts around recommendations for a team leader who is trying to lead um, a recruiting team of six plus recruiters or what have you? Kind of how do they know what's going on? Because they're not sitting next to the recruiter's desk, but how are they envisioning what's going on or how they seeing what's going on? Any thoughts around that? Yeah, so I, I really think that they have to be comfortable with pulling data at the team and individual level, which really looks at the stages of the recruiting process and hopefully their tools are aligned that they can actually pull that data. So how many are brand new? How many are in sourcing, assessing, interview, so that you can really understand kind of like, you know, as a, if you have a snake, as the mouse is going through the snake, what what's the cadence of the rec load that a recruiter has to really understand? And and I do find that not a lot of people are comfortable with that, particularly if they switch uh, tool sets, that you really have to spend the time to get to know the tools that can manage your day. And that will really, that investment in personal time will really pay off in the end. I think the other thing that you have to take into account is, um, you know, how have you organized your team? One of the questions that popped up was TA organization. Can you expect all recruiters to be all things. Depending upon the organization, you may need to have specialists. And again, knowing if people are having a harder time sourcing candidates, whether it's active or passive, that will tell you more. And that leader has to understand, you know, what's the candidate workflow in the first 14 days? Is it something that they're reaching out on? And so really being nimble 
Um, the other thing is, is, and you can do it with Zoom. You know, I do sit in when I'm coaching people, I do sit in on engagement meetings via Zoom, right? I do, you know, it's the same thing as if you're going on a, a sales call, um, if you're in the market that you can show up at a meeting and explain the reason for meeting. I'm a player coach. I'm here. Want to make sure that I'm learning about your business. I'm the hiring manager as well. And I think it really positions everybody for success. Do any of the panelists do, I call it an AAR, an after actions review. Once the rec is filled, are you going back and kind of having a discussion with the recruiter that filled it and or the hiring team around how many numbers do you got? Where do the candidates come from? Is it, is it part of our core talent group at your company or have you? Do you do any like conversations after the fact, after it's been filled? We don't do it at the requisition level. We do it on a on more of a standard cadence where, and we tend to look at it um, at a department level. So we would look at, you know, how is engineering recruiting doing? And we look at that at like a, co- a quarterly level and we look at how efficient the funnel is and how, um, you know, at what rate are people moving from stage to stage? How long does it take them to move from stage to stage? Things like that. Um, but we found that looking at it at a every, at least when we're dealing with some of these higher level professional roles, every role is so different that the, um, the learnings you can pull out of an individual rec is often more tied to the circumstances of that rec than it is the the process and that we really get the insights on the process when we look at it on a regular standard basis like a quarterly basis or a monthly basis and that's how i find i find that that diagnostic that deep dive usually happens when something hasn't gone well right (laughs) when you're really drilling down and that's you know that's unfortunate yeah yeah and we do it quarterly to Tomorrow actually is our QBR, where we go through, you know, all the analysis of all the racks, you know, why they've been open, you know, time to fill. So we do it on a quarterly basis, not rack to rack. Same as Christy. Yeah. No, Susan, is is your QBR that you're doing tomorrow for the current quarter or the past quarter? Past quarter. Okay. Got it. And Susan, who's the audience? It's all of TA globally and HR. So you're talking to like HR business partners, not the end client. Well, the client gets a review of their data. So we actually simplified our QBR data per department. And then we have kind of a one pager that goes to the department head, you know, and then we got their feedback. What do they, what do they want to see? You know, is it diversity numbers? Is it time to fill? So Justin Hoffman is one of those senior leaders here. And I was, you know, we wanted to simplify it because if they're not looking at it or they don't care about it, and we're spending all these enormous amounts of lift to bring them yeah. data. So we we provide that data to the business and they invite us to their meetings as well. So we share, you know, on a, you know, a, a cadence with the business too. But tomorrow, Fantastic. just, you know, the, the HR, TA kind of QBR. What what literal format are your presentations? And this is for, this is for all the panelists, but with Susan, with yours, are you presenting a, a PowerPoint? Are you... Looking at Excel. It's not a last ditch yet. But a, it is a PowerPoint. It's like 32 pages. Um, but it has a lot of graphs, a lot of data. We, we, as a TA leadership team, we wanted to simplify and we have simplified some, but, um, you know, it's a wealth of information. And, um, you know, some of it we wanted to tweak, you know, to kind of, you know, not to share so much of, you know, making the sausage, but more the, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> the positive. And, you know, we also do, um, you know, a weekly kind of ELT, which is our executive leadership team, you know, report. And it kind of feeds into that and that's weekly. But, um, you know, I hate to pull all this data, all these reports have, you know, you know, hundreds of people, not hundreds, but, you know, a lot of people working on it. And then you feel realize no one's opening it up and no one really, you know, yeah. so we've tried to really, you know, um, simplify, you know, make it, you know, what the business cares about and, um, you know, but it, it, it's PowerPoint in 32 pages at this point. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that. <laughs> we use a variety of tools in our reporting. So we have dashboards that come out of Cognos. 
which is very similar to Tableau. Um, and those are live, live ongoing data. So that that's more for dashboards. And we have dashboards for hiring managers. We have dashboards for our recruiting team. We have dashboards for um, our executive HR team as well. Um, and then we have week, uh, weekly reviews with our hiring, with departments. And those are on, um, the, those are more like a PowerPoint, more of a traditional PowerPoint type presentation. And then we do um, deep dives on a quarterly basis. So that is presented in PowerPoint, but that's a lot of work in Excel and Cognos to get there. And we also use Kibana, which is our own application for dashboarding. And we're trying to move, you know, which is Workday, Greenhouse, and then Kibana. And that would be, you know, you know, the, 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 the heavens coming out and, you know, all <laughs> shining that, that, that can be done that way. But Kibana, we did build, you know, our capacity metrics, you know, our recruiting dashboard, recruiting scorecards, you know, all the things that are executives are looking at since we do want to drink our own champagne but that's still a work in progress as well yeah. excellent thank, thank you tara susan how about we, we jump over to you your item sure. well i think as any good leader when i first came over here i was they kept saying oh guess what we're going to be hiring and that's the reason i came you know because they're going to be hiring a ton of people which is you know, what every recruiter wants to be a part of. But I was, I was like, okay, great. So where's the recruiting capacity plan? They're like, what? Um, <laughs> like, yeah, we have to have people to do that work. And um, I think they had thought it through somewhat, but I think what they didn't think through was really looking at, you know, actuals. Um, so we, including Megan, who's the TA ops, who's amazing here, she looked at historical data because what they were building the capacity model was every recruiting manager was carrying racks and every recruiter was carrying a certain number of racks. And we looked historically to kind of make sure that that was, you know, and last year was a crazy year. So we, we kind of took that out of, you know, normal metrics, but we still wanted to build a model that we could deliver on. And so, you know, because someone carrying racks in EMEA with a longer time to fill and carrying all senior racks is a different capacity than someone carrying SDR, um, lower level racks and recruiting all in one location. So we wanted to look at all the historical data of how many racks are recruiters, you know, looking, you know, covering per quarter. Um, we also wanted to look at the ramp. You know, if we have to ramp a recruiter, they're not automatically making four hires, you know, first month. So we had to build that into it. We also had to build the level, like I said, into it. We have some, as y'all probably know, a lot of recruiters burning out right now. I mean, they're recruiting all the time. There's no, you know, end to the madness. Um, and there's a lot of people hiring rec great recruiters right now. So we wanted to have a buffer for people burning out. Um, we, we definitely have some people on leave right now from burnout. And, um, you know, we haven't, knock on wood, lost many recruiters, <laughs> but, but we want to make sure that we're able to deliver to the business. So we built the model, this capacity model. We, we took the overall headcount per region. So EMEA, which is Americas, Asia Pacific, and EMEA. And then we took the existing recs that we're going to carry over. Then we looked at the incremental because as we all know, as good as it gets from a workforce plan, there's always going to be these incremental asks. So what I did is I went to finance and I said, tell me over the historically over the past, you know, three to four years, how many incremental heads on top of the workforce plan are we getting? And then we built that number into it. Then we took the, the attrition rate and what they had always done previously is like taken, you know, just a general attrition rate. For engineering, our attrition rate was 12. For go to market, it was 20. That's not reality. So I said, we're going to put the actual attrition, you know, that we have per department into the headcount. And then that number was, you know, um, built. And then we built our, you know, recruiting, you know, headcount plan around that number, you know, and then we, you know, they wanted, you know, our recruiting managers to recruit. And I said that you can't be a good man, in my opinion, you can't be a good recruiting manager, managing eight recruiters and carry your own recruit 
low. You either do one or the other. And so we pulled them out of the headcount number this year, which was awesome. And, and that was done. We had to meet with our CPO and my boss to be able to do that. But they, we kind of bought, got everybody's buy-in and then we built our headcount plan around that number. And I think that's, you know, the most important thing you can do. I remember my boss at Salesforce and my boss at DocuSign, you know, he was always finessing the number of recruiters that we need. That was, he, that was his number one job. He did it really, really well. He had tight relationships with finance. He knew exactly when we needed to hire recruiters and he knew how to do it ahead of time. Because, you know, you don't just go and hire 20 recruiters or five recruiters or a recruiter yeah. in right now in EMEA or hiring a French speaking recruiter. That doesn't happen overnight. You have to backload those out of the headcount plan. So I think it's the most important part of um, being a leader. And if you can't solve for that or you can't build your capacity in your TA org around the workforce plan, you're going to have escalations. You're not going to be able to provide that white glove treatment and you're certainly not going to be able to execute well. So that's kind of the recruiting by numbers that I wanted to share. And it's just, it's critical. Uh, Susan, one other, one other thing to consider, depending upon how, um, how good the organization is securing approval before they reach you. I've had work with organizations where they close and a crazy amount of requisitions, you know, five, 10, three months into a search. And that really also impacts uh, rec recruiter productivity. And I yeah. think that sometimes that's overlooked. Um, it could be because of, you know, budget um, strings are being tightened, but you might find that in some organizations, there's more flagrant offenders mm -hmm. um, that you just have to really plan for because it's, you know, it's hard for the brand in the marketplace. It's really discouraging for the recruiters as well. Yeah. yeah. I, and I really like what you had to say, Susan, about that workforce planning, because in many ways, um, now I, I'm going to, my roots are from marketing. So I, I, I did consumer packaged goods marketing for about 16 years before I switched over to TA. And this is really not any different than a sales force. Right. And they're selling jobs, right? <laughs> that's what, that's what they're in. I mean, in layman's term, they're selling jobs. And when you have a sales force, you don't expect a sales force to do nothing but but um, sell either, right? They have to have part of their time doing things about learning about the business so that they know what they're selling. Exactly. And lots of times, um, organizations forget that about recruiters. Yep. That they need that that bandwidth to be able to do things other than just going out and talking to people because they need to know what they're going to talk about. Yep. Exactly. I mean, you've got to train your kid on it um, here at Elastic. I mean, there's a curve, you know, all the systems from Greenhouse to Slack to Textio to, you know, everything that you have to know, the process internally, how to write an offer, how to open a rack, how to do this in Workday, how to do that. You know, it's just not something you can snap your fingers. And when I talked to Paul, who's our CRO president, he's like, what can I do for you, Susan? I was like, get me more recruiters. <laughs> and he, and he said, I said, it's not just like going and stopping your fingers. The best recruiters are just like salespeople. They're, you know, they've got jobs and they're, you know, yeah. doing well other places. I want to make sure that we're hired, we're able to deliver to your number. And when I have to do that with a fully staffed team, fully ramped team. And he said, I get it. I'll, I'll, I'll promise <laughs> you, I'll get you your recruiters. <laughs> but, but to have the math and the science behind it, um, and to show kind of your executives, like, this is how we came up with this. And this is this historical data, you know, not everybody's doing for a month and, you know, our recruiting managers, this is what they're doing. And they, they shouldn't be carrying a full rec load and be able to build that out and then say, you know what, we're not a tritting it. This, this is what the reality is. This is what it looks like. And if you don't factor in the real attrition, we're always going to be behind. And so it's an education, but you no, know, it's simple math. And, and not only that, I love it when pe people talk about the, they're not going to grow the organization and they say, oh, well, you're not hiring this year. And it's like, well, nope, still got to replace that 8% of people that are going to leave yeah. if you want to keep a flat organization. So that's hundreds of hires. Like we still have to do hundreds of hires. Yes. Yes. And at my previous company, we started a trading at a very uncomfortable clip and then you know you you're in you're in you're in a world of hurt because 
you, you can't keep up. So, um, right. so yeah, but anyways. Quick question for you, Susan, kind of like almost when I talk, when I think about forecasting new hires come in or have you like the number one little piece of information I need to get and try and get it first is what, what positions are coming down the line? Are, yes. It sounds like your company is entering in kind of to, to Tara's point, they're entering in the financial system, they're getting approval and they are legitimate recs, right? That are coming through the pipeline to the recruiting team. Yes. Well, we, what, what we took it one step back, we're actually working with our finance and our planning partners okay. to look at, at, you know, what, not only what FY22 is what we call it will look like, but all the incremental ads. So we, we were building our model around what their model is. So it's on top, it will lay on top of the workforce plan. So it'll show, okay, if you're going to want to grow this much and you're going to want to do this amount of hiring, this is the amount of recruiters that we, you would need. And, and then it, it, it literally just plugs it out. And the nice thing, you know, the success of it all was we did it and we got, we got two additional headcount right now with just to, before they even solidify the, the, the new headcount for next year. So, um, and it was cool because, you know, the one hire that I just mentioned, Amia France, TA is not going to be an easy one to fill because we need to be trilingual and we need to go out and direct source for that. But, and there's a waiting period of two months. So they gave it to us early to go ahead and get in front of that. Any thoughts for a TA leader that works at a company, they just can't get the hiring teams to put the data in, to let them, to give them the heads up, basically. If, if you're a TA leader I trying to- the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> to the top. You know, because it you have to have that. You know, um, you know, and if they're, you know, I I, I work with a smaller company just doing some consulting, and I kind of got the same answer. They were just doing their workforce kind of willy nilly, um, <laughs> and that'll be difficult. You know, to plan accordingly. It's like planning to build a house without an architectural plan. You know, it's just kind of, you know, you you can't do it effectively. So I would try to you know, educate the most higher level person there um, that this is what we're going to need to be successful. You also might want to think about, you know, you, I think you all know the ones that are not as good as the other groups about forecasting. And so how do you figure out um, talking to the business leader and HR about if we can get this right, it can help them meet their business goals. Exactly. Um, right. And so particularly if it's a revenue generating function, or a product development function, it's really important that you're getting ahead and appealing beyond HR. You, ha you have to kind of appeal to the person whose bonus is gonna get paid on, do they make their revenue numbers or not? Got it. So quick okay. question for the, the panel around uh, attrition and back working backfill racks. So I I'm, I'm love that you ladies are talking about backfill and including that in the proposed work that's mm -hmm. coming. One of the metrics that I do for in benchmarking is looking at the past year, past quarter, what percent of recs worked were backfill, right? So kind of getting back to the almighty in benchmarking, everybody, everybody always talks about time to fill. Not everybody, but a lot of people talk time to fill is this key metric. I would come back and argue that time to fill is only important on a back to fill rec. Person left, you need to get somebody in that position as quickly as possible. But if I'm doing my job as a strategic leader and we're planning in our net new growth, right? So it's net new versus backfill. If I know in Q3 or Q4 that we have 40 positions coming down the line, I'm not going to wait to the last minute to start recruiting and try and have a good time to fill number. I'm going to be starting ahead of the game and start recruiting that rec early, which would kind of ruin my time to fill number. Does anybody use time to fill in their benchmarking information with the business at all? I would argue that time to fill is a horrible measure in pretty much any scenario. <laughs> um, because the cost of being wrong is so high that if, if, the, if you do the things just to make your time to fill shorter and you make mistakes, you're going to wipe out any benefit that you got to filling that position sooner. Um, we use a... a measure that I think we've created, which is actually we call candidate velocity. So instead of measuring how fast we fill a rec, we measure how fast candidates are actually moving through the process. 
so that we know that if we get if we get qualified candidates and we move them through the process fast enough, we will fill jobs as soon as they can be filled with a high quality candidate. And that's really the important part is filling all as your jobs as quickly as possible with the right quality of candidate. Um, so that's that's kind of how we do it is we kind of measure we we created this candidate velocity measure of how fast candidates are moving through the process. Christy, I totally agree with you. In fact, every, anytime I've done an analysis of time to fill, only 50% of it is the recruiting organization. And much of the lag comes with interview, <laughs> follow up, getting feedback. And, you know, it's a two way metric and clients don't always want to hear that. I was just having this conversation yesterday. So I think that's another thing to, to take a look at is, you know, where are we moving and can we control it? And what are the sluggish points? You know, are there too many people in the interview process, right? Do you really need 10 people to interview a junior level person? Probably not, right? So, but you need those insights to be able to say. The other thing is, because I had this recently, you know, I had somebody not in the TA function calculate the time to fill for software engineers. And they said it was like 92 days and they, they put a monetary number on it. And they said, well, this is awful. And I said, actually, it beats the benchmark. Right. So 90 right. days isn't bad relative to the benchmark. If the benchmark is 110, we're actually doing very well. So you, it has to be geography, function right. and a lot of other things. Yeah, we, um, our CEO at Elastic put a five person maximum on any interview. So, and you see the executives go, well, we can put three people together. <laughs> we can, we'll, we'll, we won't tell, but, but he, you know, we were just discussing it because we haven't asked Shai anything today, which he comes on and the company can ask him anything we want. But we were talking about recruiting and the velocity and making sure people go through the process as quickly as possible, but keeping the quality metric. So he made right. a you know, a five person panel rule. So no more than five people, even at executive level. So you gotta be careful who you pick for that panel because you're not gonna be able to add to it. And it, it's simple, but it kind of works. Christine, your velocity, what are your like key milestones for that, that candidate going through it? Are, is it screen, onsite interview, offer? Do you have like a certain set of key milestones? Yeah, I mean, really we're, we're looking at how long does it take for us to engage them? once they once we've connected right how long does it take us to preliminarily define whether they're qualified or not then how do we then how long does it take us to get through the selection process of is this a person we want to hire and then the last part is is this does this get us uh, how long does it take us to actually finish the pro and close the deal finish the process and close the deal so it's really for main segments that we kind of, we have lots of sub statuses that we use, but for us, we actually group it, all, all those sub statuses into one of those four buckets. And then we actually measure the velocity through those four buckets instead of each individual sub process. Now, internally, when we're going through it, we might, we might do a deep dive into the selection section of the process in order to get wasted what we call non-value added time so we want to maximize the amount of value added time we're spending with candidates so we often will go through our processes to make sure that we aren't accumulating a lot of non-value added time like emailing back and forth about availability completely non-value added time right but it can take forever it can take as long to get availability and schedule a candidate as it can take to actually do the interview, which is ridiculous. So we, we focus on identifying where that non-value added time is so that we can reallocate that to more value added time with the candidates. So once we got all these pieces together and we, we have our data, we know where our data is, we kind of know our numbers, right? You know your company's numbers. Are we just benchmarking against ourselves? Are we benchmarking against some industry standard or once we know our numbers, what are we benchmarking against? Or is this, it's our own historical numbers. We subscribe to Deloitte Burson um, and that provides a lot of benchmarking data for us. Um, and then I also use Sherm a lot to do um, some benchmarking on there as well. 
And then I use forums like this to ask people what they're doing or what their expectations are and using my network to, to ask them, you know, how, how do how they tackle this problem, you know, or, or what findings did they have that we can dig into deeper. Yeah. Sean, I'm sorry. I know that we we're a little bit over. Unfortunately, I have to run. But okay. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for everyone who joined the conversation. Sorry, I didn't get you in time. Or, That's okay. I'm really quick. Uh, maybe I'll give a shot at covering what you're covering. I'll let you go. I won't hold you up. I appreciate okay. it. Thanks. I will, I will jump in. I know we're, we're past that half hour mark. Uh, Chrissy was going to be talking about uh, utilizing assessments and quality of hire. Maybe I kind of throw this to Tara and Susan. Are you doing any type of assessments with candidates or is it just employees or what are your thoughts around assessments and on whom and when? Yeah, we're going to, I just, I did it at my um, previous company and I'm going to use it again here, but we're going to use predictive index, um, which is an assessment tool, both cognitive ability as well as behavioral. And I wanted to get a little bit more groundswell. I wanted to include our HR team. I wanted to include our learning and development team. And I wanted to get executive buy-in and um, before I just said, hey, this is what I want to do, because it is a huge lift. And then I had to get it um, approved through our procurement process and then budgeted for. So it will be a May rollout, but I've been real successful in implementing it. I implemented it at um, uh, SAP and at DocuSign and at New Relic and then soon to um, be here at Elastic. And are you using that with employees or candidates or both? Um, with, with, well, you'll benchmark the employees. So you'll build a pattern of success for every role. And I'll start with field operations, which is, that's what I manage. But, and then you will use it both as an assessment tool in the recruiting cycle, but also as a post hire to manage and coach people. So we'll have our L&D and enablement team use it to move people beyond the role that they're hired into. Right. I agree with Susan. I've used predictive index as well as some other tools. And it really has to be a partnership between HR, the business, because understanding what good or great looks like could be a moving target, particularly if an organization doesn't have great metrics to measure beyond a one digit annual performance rating, right? So you really have to be careful and make sure that that is not biased and be very diligent about making sure there's no adverse impact. Um, and that you have an ongoing monitoring system. So it's really role-based from what I've seen. Um, and so you might have different vehicles depending upon what you're trying to solve. Um, I've never, um, I will say that it's a huge learning curve. I think HR comes to the table really wanting to help us hone in, but getting the business success criteria can be a challenge. And so it depends on how good your business is in saying, this is what we're looking for. And these are the metrics that we're saying, this makes incumbents good. Yeah, we had used it real successfully at DocuSign, and after a year of using PI, we were able to show a direct correlation between somebody hitting their number and following the pattern of success. They were five yeah. times more likely. So after that year, after the regression analysis and able to share that with the senior leadership, then everybody, you know, wanted in. Um, but it's a huge lift to the organization. And I don't think at DocuSign, we did a great job using it post-hire. That's why when I came here, I really wanted to get my HRBPs buy-in, share with them what the, you know, what it looked like, you know, from, an, you know, cause there's so many reports that it pulls out, but I wanted to make sure that they were comfortable, you know, using it, you know, beyond just assessing the candidate cause it can be a very powerful tool. They have a new um, capability where it's called Teams. And so not only when you bring somebody in, you can look at them as an individual performer, but also in the, the constructs of working within that team and how is that team dynamics. So that's a new module for um, PI. So I'm excited to use that as well. Um, but I've, I've had a lot of success with them. Another tool that we did use as well last two, I haven't done it here. I'm still kind of getting my sea legs and, um, 
fixing some broken windows, as they say, <laughs> and getting my capacity model done. But um, another tool that we've used is 360 skill survey which is a back end of the recruiting cycle, which will give you a scoring um, of that candidate um, on a scale of one to seven, seven being the highest um, in that individual role. And it's based on the references. And then they can also score you based on, you know, your company's core, you know, um, you know, culture, you know, fit. And so we use that really successfully at a previous company two times. Um, and so I eventually, you know, probably future state would like to use something like that too. Let me ask you too a question around, this sort of stems from a lot of our sessions last year too, pulling like DE and I into the conversation. LOD never came into it. HR partners never came into it. We're all mostly recruiting. Do you see like this connection? Like I look at HR is made up of four different teams. There's recruiting, to get them in, there's HR business partners, there's LOD, learning and organizational development, then DE and I around diversity and inclusion. It's almost like these are the way I'm envisioned is these four groups all working together, right? Eating at the same table with each one another, trying to bring in the best talent, keep the best talent, and develop the talent that we have. Do you, have you seen or do you propose any like benchmarking or giving a good analysis with those four teams in mind? kind of doing that whole 360 internally? I think that's a great question. Um, I haven't seen it done that well, <laughs> um, you know, because, but, but I would love to hear Tar's um, input on that. Um, my companies, I'm going to go at it differently here, you know, um, in terms of implementing um, and really wanted my HR business partner, my kind of right hand person to buy into it before I ever even, you know, suggested using it. So if she had said, no, I don't want to do that, then that would have been the answer. Because I think when you don't have the buy-in and you don't have, you know, um, L and D, you know, and I talked to George Young as the head of enablement. And I said, I made him do his assessment, showed him what the details of it are and made sure he was comfortable because if he's not, I don't want to do it because to be successful, like you said, there's there's four different buckets. You, know, you have to have, you know, the recruiting right. You have to have the HR, you know, developing people internally, and then, you know, doing the DNI right. But also, you know, post hire learning and development, and you know, making sure that employees engaged. If you can do all well, I mean, then you've got the kumbaya. But I don't want to do. I have gone against HR in doing things, and that you know, or not got, not even gone against, but just not getting their buy-in up front. And then they feel threatened or they're like, what is she doing over here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think it's so important to, to seek to understand and to, to educate them what you want to do and then get their buy-in to make sure that those, all those pillars, like you said, can be successful in managing the employee throughout the life cycle. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and let's remember, it works the other way too, right? Sometimes an HR DNI group will come up with something and then they tell us they're doing something <laughs> and then not really thinking about how that actually in, impacts the TA discussion. So I think, you know, that partnership is really important. And however the HR teams are designed, roles and responsibilities have to be very clear. Um, and so if you're, if you're partnering with a business team in HR, you just have to make sure that the communication is happening. I mean, everybody's going so fast these days, it's hard to keep up. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that everybody wants to improve the process. It's the time and the energy that catches us off guard all the time. Yeah. And I apologize. I'm going to go deal with my mouth pain, oh, um, but I have to jump off because I think I'm going to pass out. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, okay. jump off. Uh, Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you later. Sarah or Susan, I'll, I'll end it here. We've gone sort of long. Appreciate it. Once again, another good conversation. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I think this is one of those top level conversations that it's it's an ongoing discussion. And I, there's this thing I call captain of the ship. Like that's that person leading the group. And when they leave and a new captain comes in, all things have to restart for some reason. Um, but yeah. that's just the way the world is in many places. All right. Thank you, Susan. I'll let you go. Uh, thank you, audience members. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.